Robert, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, I'm uh, a philosopher of religion, uh, Christian. I uh, am uh, chair of the department here at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, I've written uh, written a number of books on special divine action um, and uh, quite a few quite a few articles. Cool. Uh, today's topic was divine intervention and laws of nature. Could you tell us your position on that? Because I know the classic position um, is that you can't have miracles, can't have divine intervention from human because that would be a violation of the laws of nature. And those don't happen. So what is what is your position on the topic? Well, the uh, the classic argument of critics against miracle, or one of them, uh, stems from uh, David Hume. And he put forward uh, the following argument. He said, well, if we're going to uh, believe in miracles, we ought to do so on the basis of evidence. And the rational person believes that uh, for which you have the most evidence. And he goes on to say, well, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And he then asked the question, he says, well, which do we have more evidence for, uh, the testimony for miracles? Uh, Hume presumes that you'd never see one yourself, and he's interested in uh, undermining uh, Christian accounts. So he's talking about testimonial accounts. He says, uh, could the testimonial account for a miracle ever outweigh the amount of evidence we have for law of nature? And he says, uh, given that they conflict, given that you can only have one or the other, we should take the option that has the most evidence. And he says, then, by the nature of the case, we will always have more evidence for the laws of nature than we do for, uh, for miracles. And on that basis, he has argued that uh, there could never even in principle be enough testimonial evidence uh, to believe in a miracle. Uh, now, I should uh, I should say that some uh, commentators they do want to claim that Hume allowed that in principle there could be enough evidence, but I think that uh, they misread the uh, I think they misread Hume's essay of miracles when they say that. I think they're saying what they think Hume should have said rather than what he did in fact say. One clarifying question, was Hume referring to there couldn't be any kind of evidence or specifically testimonial? He's, he, Hume takes for granted uh, that you wouldn't see one yourself. Uh, he's, uh, he's very uh, definitely uh, a non-believer, so he doesn't really ever consider uh, the possibility of observing one yourself. Uh, in addition, if you're looking at Christianity, at this point, we would only have testimonial evidence. We couldn't have firsthand evidence of the resurrection. Um, so he doesn't really, uh, he doesn't really ever consider that there would be anything other than testimonial evidence for a miracle. Make a distinction between like uh, scientific testable evidence versus uh, testimonial evidence. So like if a scientist could confirm it in a lab some way, testable predictions, um, I'm, he wouldn't simply consider that testimonial. Would he be like, this is something worth more than simply the testimony of somebody? Well, he doesn't really consider that, but it would be testimonial evidence because unless you're the scientist doing it yourself, uh, if you uh, say, well, I've tested this in my lab and this is what I report, I found that, uh, the event occurred, uh, pretty well all of what we believe in science is ultimately based on testimony from people whom we, uh, whom we trust. Uh, so for example, um, if I say that I think that uh, physicists have uh, established the existence of the Higgs boson particle, uh, my uh, justification for accepting that will be uh, testimony. And indeed, the justification for most scientists accepting it will be testimony. 
to the effect that, well, we did this and that we can replicate it, but no scientist ever replicates more than a very, very small fraction of what uh, he believes to be uh, scientific. Right, because I would think that Hume accepted a lot of the scientific data at the time period, and he didn't do the tests himself, but I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, I believe in, like in my eyes, I see that as different than testimonial evidence, even though it's coming from the words of a scientist or whatever, that it is literally a testimony, because the quality of evidence is something that can, is put through the scientific method, which has a peer review process of many people testing it out and verifying it to be able to falsify a claim. So if there was, if testimony was false, you'd expect contravening testimonies of the other scientists uh, as opposed to confirmatory ones. And because we have this reliable methodology, it seems more trustworthy than simply testimony. And so in this case, if Hume was like me, I would imagine he would make a distinction between simply testimony of miracles versus repeatably verifiable testimony of some kind that could in principle be tested. Well, I think what you're, uh, I think what you're getting at is when we have uh, testimony from people we consider reliable, and when it's testimony from more than one person, from a group of people, we trust it more. Um, but I would, I would argue it's still testimony. Um, well, now, my question is more from Hume's perspective. Would Hume still consider it the same as the kind of testimony he's talking about? Because I would say probably not. I think that the kind of testimony he's talking about is more like historical testimony or something. Like just someone wrote down they had some experience. Um, as opposed to someone giving a concise methodology of how to verify this experience from any perspective in the world kind of a thing. Um, I see there's a I would think Hume would consider these different, which is why he would be skeptical of miracle claims, but not skeptical of archaeology or something. Um, well, the I think you're maybe getting at what's known as the demarcation problem. Uh, we can talk of uh, historical science and uh, operational science or normal science. Um, archaeology is... Uh, is a historical science. Uh, you can't, when you identify something as uh, an arrowhead from a certain culture, um, you can't go into the laboratory and uh, and perform reg, uh, multiple. You can't go in and repeat because you're talking about a historical uh, historical uh, artifact. Um, now Hume would. Uh, I think Hume is pretty rigorous. I think he would admit that the laws of nature, uh, his acceptance of them is ultimately based on testimony, it, but he's going to say that the amount of testimony for the laws of nature plus his own experience um, uh, justifies them. Um, but you asked, uh, you asked what my position was, and I think that Hume's argument is something of a red herring in that it depends on, it depends on the claim that the evidence for the laws of nature is at conflict with the evidence for miracles. Uh, so getting this balance of probabilities argument going depends on the two bodies of evidence uh, being in uh, conflict with one another. And what I would argue is that they're not in conflict with one another. The laws of nature do not by themselves uh, tell us what will happen in the world. Uh, as an illustration, if an apple is falling from a tree and I reach out my hand and catch it, I've not violated the law of gravity. Um, I'm simply an intervening cause. Similarly, if I uh, throw something up in the air, I haven't violated the law of gravity. The law is operating at all times. Um, I'm simply an intervening cause. So God can produce a, uh, a miracle, not by violating the uh, laws of nature, 
but by being an intervening cause. As an example, suppose you were going to uh, be playing a game of billiards, and as you line up to make your shot, uh, just as you do that, as you're making your shot, I roll another ball onto the table. The chances are I will change what would otherwise have happened, but at no moment will I have violated Newton's uh, laws of motion. So God can produce a miracle without ever violating the laws. And the importance of that, the implication of that, is that you can't oppose the evidence for a miracle to the evidence for the laws of nature. And if you can't oppose those two bodies of evidence, then the rational thing to do, unless you have reason to think that a posteriori that the evidence, the testimonial evidence is bad, then the rational thing to do is accept uh, both bodies of evidence. Well, how could God be like an intervening force via the laws of nature? Like obviously he could change gravity in some way um, to make the apple fall faster or sooner or something, but that seems like it would in fact be an intervention uh, breaking the laws of nature because in order to change gravity in this one instance no i haven't require... said he changes gravity he doesn't change gravity when i reach out and catch the falling apple i have not changed the law of gravity i've simply an intervening cause so no uh, my position doesn't require god in any way to alter the laws of nature well that's what i'm asking now what what is god doing that qualifies as a miracle in this instance is it something like if this was already predetermined at the origin of the creation of the universe kind of a thing where he just set it in motion so this would happen at, at a convenient time or is it more like he's changing the psychology of the individual to make them do something what what exactly oh. is god doing that qualifies as a miracle in this example well take as a test case um uh in the new testament uh, we have a record of Jesus multiplying loaves and fishes, or God multiplying loaves and fishes. Um, so uh, God could perform a miracle simply by creating uh, more of the stuff that makes up the fish. So God could create a fish that had no prior history. Going forward, it would obey all the laws of nature. It would go stale. It would break down. But uh, its origin, its origin would not be um, would not be the same way a fish usually arrives in the world. But going forward, it's going to obey all the uh, all the laws of nature. Well, wouldn't the creation of a fish fish potentially be a violation of physics? There, or are you saying he did something like quantum mechanics, where random things pop into existence out of nothing, kind of stuff? Nope, I'm not making reference to quantum mechanics. Um, perhaps what you're thinking is that maybe the scenario that I suggest would violate the principle of the conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. Potentially. I mean, I guess if you had enough energy in the area, like using sunlight or something, you could do that. Well, no, so I'm saying ex nihilo. That ex nihilo. God, ex nihilo, God can... According to theism, at the moment of creation, God created matter out of nothing. Um, the uh, suggestion I'm making that miracles would be little acts of creation. Uh, so God uh, could create more matter. And when we talk of laws of nature as explaining things, they only explain things in conjunction with a set of initial conditions and on the assumption that there's no intervening cause. Um, so God, by altering the conditions to which the laws apply, can bring about an event uh, that violates no laws of nature, yet is something that nature would not produce on its own. Because I think, I think Hume would interpret that as a violation of the laws of nature in that the laws of nature are going in some direction and God essentially creates a bubble where the laws of nature as they were going are no longer going. So if God creates a new fish or something, the laws of nature where, which are governing um, the air particles, um, the water particles, the gravitational particles of that 
location would now have to be affected by this new thing which was not there prior which seems like it would be a violation of the laws of physics um, well no what law of physics have i violated when i reach out and catch that apple the, I have not law violated of the law uniformity of so uniformity if god nature. if god creates an apple on a tree uh, what law of nature has he violated? I think you'll find the only uh, plausible candidate will be the principle of the conservation of energy. Um, well, why not like uh, uniformity of nature or something along those lines where, because if we think gravity is affecting the earth because it has a mass of X and then you say plus one to the mass by adding a fish or something, um, you've now changed the um, gravitational force. That would be essentially no different than literally just increasing the gravitational force with a little dial in, in God's hands or whatever, which would be a violation of the laws of physics. And so why would adding in new mass, uh, which would increase the gravitation gravitational effect of this location, be any different than literally just increasing the gravitational force um, in that location by switching a dial? I wouldn't see the difference there. You're... Um you haven't changed the law of gravity the law of gravity will still be the uh, inverse square law what you've done is you've provided more of the material to which the law of gravity applies but you haven't changed the law of gravity the law of gravity will still be that the force uh, is uh, consistent with the inverse square law but wouldn't that violate lots of the laws of physics because it seems like it doesn't violate any of them it may violate the it may arguably violate the principle of the conservation of energy if you understand that principle as saying energy can neither be created nor destroyed yeah and okay. the second law entropy uh things always move to disorder rather than order the second law is the law of entropy um that uh we don't uh that would be uh um, because well, if you're generating why. like a fish or something in the location, you would need some kind of external energy source in order that is expending a greater amount of energy um, than it takes to composite the fish or something. Because well, otherwise, you're generating something um, from no no prior loss of energy, which would then be a violation of the second law because it's not going from order to disorder. It's just going order pops out of nothing. Well, let's get to the second law after we deal with the first law. Um, the second law, um, sorry, the first law is sometimes interpreted as uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And uh, alternatively, it's uh, expressed as in an isolated system uh, the amount of energy remains constant. Okay. Uh, now, just before I go there, you said an alternative energy source. Um, energy would not be transferred from anywhere if God creates energy. It would simply be created. Okay. So it's not like there'd have to be some pool of energy in some otherworldly place that we transfer some over. Okay. Now, as regards that those two interpretations of the first law, uh, historically, people have confused them and thought they are logically equivalent. In fact, they're not. Um, the claim that energy can neither be uh, created nor destroyed would a priori rule out theism. In fact, it would a priori rule out Big Bang cosmology. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't see. I don't follow that part because well, if energy cosmology... can neither be created nor destroyed, and the universe is made of energy then it could not have come into existence. If energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can't come into existence. But we know that the universe has come into existence. Well, I think most typical theories in physics say that it's a fluctuation of a previous, previously existing something, quantum field, string theory, multiverse, whatever. Um, so it didn't come into existence ex nihilo. The energy was already there. It's just displacement uh, or something. But I don't think you're correct there, Tom. Um, the Big Bang theory is usually taken to mean that uh, space, time, energy, and matter have an absolute beginning. 
Uh, ours, not all. So, like, if you go to the most recent poll I know of is a snapshot of foundational attitudes towards quantum mechanics um, by Schlosshauser. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And there's a, a questionnaire about what, what origin of the Big Bang and what's the consensus view of the origin of the Big Bang. It's like 40% uh, multiverse or many worlds and then like 10% string theory or something. None of them say Big Bang, like the origin of literally everything as the Big Bang is like zero percent like nobody thinks we're going that. to have to agree to disagree on that because uh, i can uh, give you all sorts of references uh, and i think the majority opinion is in fact that the universe had an absolute beginning um, well i think by that they mean our universe not literally all natural stuff well if well it's off our topic but uh if you're going to start to uh talk about the multiverse one we have no empirical evidence for it and two, people like Robin Collins have argued that uh, you would have to have a multiverse generator, which would be uh, finely tuned to talk about a multiverse. So um, you would know the board Billiken uh, board uh, uh, yeah. Guth Lincoln. Uh, yeah. board that any Lincoln. any expanding universe uh, has an absolute beginning, um, and that's, well, that's pretty well accepted. Here it is. Well, n no, like there's actually, I have a video I can show it to you if you want of the Lincoln and Guth specifically saying that the board Guth and Lincoln theorem shows nothing other than the fact the expansion had a beginning. It doesn't say anything about the universe any, itself. After the what beginning. it says, what the theorem says is any expanding universe has an absolute beginning. Well, no, that's the false thing. So I have video of Guth and Vilinkin, which I'm happy to pull up and show you, of them specifically saying that is incorrect. What it does say is that the expansion had a beginning. Um, I can give you a quote from Vilikin too. So maybe uh, uh, we'll have to agree to disagree, but uh, I have a quote from him well, saying it's any any of this. Um, well, I, I literally have him on video for a interview specifically on this topic of being used in the context of the Kalam Cosmological, where he was specifically asked, is what the theists say in this context the correct application and he says no and I'm, i'll try and find it well he um, doesn't like the kalam argument but he certainly agrees that any universe that is expanding has an absolute beginning now the question of whether god is the cause of that is is a different question uh, i don't think so i'm pretty sure that's literally not what he believes well i'm uh, i I can pull up, it may take me some time, but I can pull up quotations from him. Um, please, please do. I'll yeah. find mine and we'll, we can. Um, I'll see if I, shall we uh, see if we can find it? Yeah, I'm, I'm on my, looking for mine right now. Okay, just let me see if I can find it. How do you spell the Lincoln? Va Lincoln. One, two, three, four. Schedule transcripts, schedule P. There it is. All right, so I'm going to put that there. Um, put this here and share screen. Um, share screen, share audio. Can you see my screen just to check? Um, Picture of a YouTube face, redhead. Uh, um, I'm not, I'm not sure, sure what I can see. 
Oh, I'll, I'll look yours, yours and then, then I'll, I'll back, back to my mic. Oh, okay. Uh, as long as you can hear it, that's fine. Just let me know if you can hear it. Mm -hmm. Abandoning its belief in the applicability of the penrose hockey theorem, Kalam advocates switched to a newer theorem, known as the border guth and Vilenkin theorem. Can you hear that? Can the chat, can you guys hear that? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. So in fact, the bord guth vilenkin theorem does imply an absolute beginning of the universe. I was working with Arvind Borda and Alex Vilenkin to understand uh, what we can learn about how inflation might have started and how far back it could have gone. And in particular, once we realized that inflation could be eternal into the future, it seemed like a very natural question to ask, could inflation have also been eternal into the past? Uh, and what we found was that inflation could not be eternal into the past. Uh, what we basically managed to achieve was proving a theorem uh, which says that the uh, any expanding region of space-time uh, that has some minimum expansion rate uh, can only go back so far and not infinitely far. Uh, so that means that inflation must have had a beginning. It doesn't really say that the universe must have had a beginning, uh, but it says that the universe could not have been expanding forever uh, up until the present time. So we interviewed a uh, by Ashtakar, and you know, in their model they have a, a bouncing universe, and they say, well, mm -hmm. that, that means the universe could be eternal in the past, and that theorem doesn't yes. prevent that. Am I, is that right? Uh, yeah, that is right. The theorem proves that inflation must have a beginning, right? Uh, the, the universe uh, as a whole, um, it doesn't, the theorem doesn't say that. It says that the uh, Expansion of the universe must have a beginning, right? So, but uh, it, it opens the door somewhat for alternatives. As we've seen. So that was both Guth and Vilenkin specifically saying it does not say the universe has a beginning. It's just the inflation. Okay, let me... Uh, um... Here is the uh, quotation um, from uh, Villenkin. Um, he writes, we have no viable models of an eternal universe. The BGV theorem gives us reason to believe that such models simply cannot be constructed. And he goes on to note, the theorem is sweeping in its generality it makes no assumptions about gravity or matter. Gravity may be attractive or repulsive, light rays may converge or diverge, and even general relativity may decline. The theorem would still hold. Uh, in his book, Many Worlds in One, The Search for Other Universes, uh, this is 2006, uh, he writes, with the BGV proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And that's uh, found on page 176. Um, well, I believe by that he means the models. The models, don't, I agree the models don't work. We don't have any models that actually work. But um, when it talks about- So there about are no models of, there are no cosmological models that uh, work without a beginning of the universe? Well, no, they don't work as in there's no models that accurately describe the evidence we see in physics and can answer the questions in physics such that they are acceptable models to actually say might be something that describes the fundamental nature of reality. Um, it, they're just generalized guesses, more or less. Nobody thinks that any of the models in physics are like really good at describing but, reality. But that doesn't that, mean that there isn't a beginning, it just means the models don't work yet, which is very young models that don't have enough data. Um, but you, then you're giving me a, a promissory note. Um, what Vilenkin was saying in that quote is that uh, there we have no evidence for a past eternal universe. Um, 
sort of, but there's no evidence against it either. That's that's the point. Um, I think that he says no to that, uh, Tom. Well, I did just show a recent clip of him last year admitting this. And I just camera. I just read you a quote where he says there are no past eternal universes on our best evidence. Now, well, in that they book, say, well, as further evidence comes in, maybe uh, they will allow you to say what you want to say. But that's a promissory note. That's not our best science. In addition, you have uh, the second law, which says that energy gets um, more evenly dispersed in the universe. If you had an infinitely old universe, you would have a universe that was presumably at, at all the same temperature. It isn't, which says it hasn't had long enough for the second law to run its course. Um, so I, I'm, I mean, we're getting off the topic of divine intervention, but yeah. you know, I'm happy to uh, go head to head with you on the scientific uh, evidence there. Yeah, I would love to get the link in here to confirm which position he says, because I'd be willing to bet a significant portion of money I'm right on this since I've emailed him and specifically asked him about this. But yes, and uh, I'm giving you a quote from Vilenkin, and I can give you all sorts of quotes from other astrophysicists who are saying that the Big Bang is best interpreted as an absolute beginning to the universe. So uh, neither one of us is an expert uh, in the area. So... Uh, I guess we're going to have to go with dueling experts. Sure, but I, I'd say that from my research, the consensus leans in my direction and the BGV leans in my direction and I yeah. bet and money guess, on it. And guess what I would say? Yeah. From my research, <laughs> the consensus goes in my direction. So um, I don't know that we're going to solve this in five minutes today, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, give uh, references. Sure. Yeah. Um, so back to the topic of God's intervention and which laws of physics it violates. If God does say generate a fish from nothing at any particular point in space, it seems to create a bubble um, in that it affects the laws of physics differently. The laws of physics from now in a different trajectory than they were previously. But I can affect the laws of physics the same way by human agency without violating the laws. Well, I, I would consider that a violation. I think Hume would probably also consider that a violation. Um, I don't think there is such a thing. I don't think there's what any laws law. violated. Um, well, if you were able to manipulate the laws of physics and change their trajectory in some way, I'm um, not manipulating the laws. I'm changing the conditions to which they apply. Right. So, like, if you're, and we you have do to that use... constantly. Like when we build a building, we change the conditions to which the laws of nature apply but we don't say that we violated the laws of nature. Right. So if you use one law to interfere with another, you're not violating any law. But I'm not right? using one law to interfere with another. Well, that's why I would disagree. I'd say that all human actions are using one law, just electromagnetic or the... So you want, to, you want to say that it's true by definition that mind-body dualism is false? No, I'd say that's the, the best evidence we have is that the, the most supported position. But... Um, I would imagine Hume would consider that a violation if we could use our free will to do stuff in the universe. That would also qualify as kind of like a miracle that we don't have evidence for. Um, and so I don't think you can use that as evidence to support the position but we, against But Hume. our discussion is on whether we can have evidence for miracle. You can't begin by saying that. And a question I would have for you, do you want to claim that a priori we can know that God doesn't exist? No. No. So you would want to say, presumably, that we're not simply uttering a contradiction if we say that God created the universe. Right. Okay. So there could be evidence in favor of that. Sure. We were just disagreeing over whether there is, but there could yeah. be evidence in principle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say that, okay. Yeah. Like, give, give an example. I would say that if you could give a novel so prediction, that would count as evidence. If God were to create the universe the space-time nexus that we have, would he have violated any law? Uh, yes, I think he would have literally pulled him out of nothingness. Um, what, but it wouldn't be out of nothingness. If God creates ex nihilo, he makes, he makes something other than himself. Right. So are, are you saying that's logically impossible? 
No, I think that'd be a violation of the laws of physics, though, because there aren't any laws of physics no, that can There aren't do that. any laws of what are the laws of physics before there's a universe? There aren't any. Well, there it is. So God wouldn't be violating any laws of nature in creating a universe. Well, I think by violating a law of nature here, it means doing something the laws of nature can't do. But that is, uh, uh, that's a definition of a law that I don't think any, uh, you'll find in any physics book. Uh, I, I, Where have you ever seen a law of nature stated that way? Well, it'd be a violation would be the, the, the thing I'm defining, not the law part. The, the violation of a law would be doing but something. We've just, that do. we've just talked about that I can alter what will happen without violating any laws. Only by using other forces as, as the consensus. Well, no, you've just said that you, uh, in the, it's logically possible for God to have created the universe. Sure. If God mm -hmm. could create the whole, uh, the whole universe, which is a collection of mass and energy, if that's not logically impossible, then you can't claim that doing it on a smaller level is logically impossible. Right. I never said either was logically but possible. Then but I he didn't I, violate just in the first place. I, I claim both of those are violations. I, I claim both of those are violations of physics, but it's not logically impossible to violate physics. But you haven't told me what violation of physics it would be. Doing something that no law of physics can do would be a violation of the laws of physics. But you've just said it's logically possible before there's yes. any laws of physics for God to have created the universe. Yes, which is doing something none of the laws of physics can do, and therefore it would be a violation of the laws of physics. Um, I think you're using a arbitrary, uh, like a, a very strange uh, definition of a law. Like, how does that relate to when we say the law of gravity is the inverse square law? Well, I'm like, defining violation here. I'm not defining law. I'm just using the classical definition of law, but I'm defining what a violation would be. A violation of a law of physics, which uses the classical definitions of laws. But of I physics. haven't violated anything uh, if I cause, like, the laws by themselves don't tell us anything about what will happen in the world. If you've got a parking lot and you've got, um, you've got Newton's laws of motion, say, that doesn't tell you what's going to happen on the parking lot in an icy on an icy day. You'd have to have cars there. You have to have a set of initial conditions. And unless you have the conditions to which the laws apply, all you have are conditionals. If that you have this if then statements. If there are two masses, they will attract each other. Uh, I'm not based... I'm not quite understanding your objection here. So like, uh, is if I created a new law of physics tomorrow, just snapped my fingers, made a new law of physics and added it to the rest of them, do you think Hume and most philosophers, most scientists would consider that a violation of the laws of physics, created new laws? But you're talking as if laws are somewhere up, somehow out there independently of that to which they apply. Um, well, sort of. I think like a law is a representation of some kind of quantum field and how it interacts and governs the universe. And so I could create a new quantum field that has some nature that causes a new kind of interaction between things and that I could describe with a law. And so if I if, created a new quantum field, which would then apply to have this new effect, which could then be described by a law, I'll be creating a new law of physics. And if I did that, that would seem like a violation of the laws of physics from the definition of most philosophers and scientists, I would imagine. If there was no physical universe, would there be any laws of nature? No, but I don't think that's relevant to the question here. So the question here is, imagine we're in the laws of physics today. And today I created a new law of physics. I just created a new fundamental force of nature or something. And I, with the quantum fields, however they work, would that be a violation of the laws of physics? And what's the relevance of that question to our discussion? Because if creating a new law now would be a violation. Creating all of the laws at the beginning would also be a violation. Uh, so if God creates laws, he's violating them? Yes, because that's not one of the laws of physics. Creating new laws isn't a law of physics. Uh, if I if God creates a law, then he's violated that law? That, that uh, seems very strange to, for you to say. Well, so if there was no laws of physics, and then God added a law of physics, 
then that would be violating the nature of reality, which did not have laws of physics, by adding in a new one. And that would be a violation of whatever laws governed reality prior to the laws of physics, which would then be a violation of the laws of whatever you want to call reality. So yes. But the laws creating, of nature would come into uh, being at the same time God created the universe. Okay. Right. So, so prior, but I think we're, we're straight. Like my argument is that God's performing a miracle doesn't require a new law. It doesn't require violating old laws. If God creates ex nihilo, a, uh, a rock, that rock is going to obey all the laws of nature. It's just there's more of reality for which the law is to apply. Now, the, the, only, um, the only law that I know of that possibly would come into claim that it's violated is the principle of the conservation of energy. And it's stated in two ways. One, that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And two, in an isolated system, energy is conserved. Now, my point is that those two expressions are not logically equivalent. The claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed is a far stronger statement and in fact would rule out theism a priori. So we have to decide which version of the law we should accept. And to the degree that it's um, supported by scientific evidence, it's the claim that energy in an isolated system is conserved uh, that has the uh, strongest evidential support. Um, all that any experiment can show you or series of experiments is that in a specific instance, uh, energy is conserved. Now, yep. you might want to ask um, or you might want to claim, well, to claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed is to give a deep structural understanding of the fact that we find in experiments that energy is conserved to the degree that the system is isolated. But that's not going to work very well. One, uh, and we've just had this argument, so maybe we'll uh, agree to disagree on it, but our best cosmology suggests that the universe had an absolute beginning. But two, the only evidence you would have for the claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed is that you've never observed it being created or destroyed. But precisely if you observe a miracle, you would have evidence for energy being created or destroyed. So it, to claim that as a, to claim the first law as an objection to claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed as an objection to miracle is akin to saying, well, you know, there are no mice in the house. And I say, why? And you say, well, there's no evidence of mice. And then I say, but I found some mice uh, scat. And then you say, well, we've already established there couldn't be any mice in the house. And I say, why? And you say, there's no evidence for them. And I say, but look, here's evidence for them. And you say, no, there couldn't be evidence for them because we've already established that. Um, so <laughs> the scientific form of the principle of the conservation of energy is that to the degree that a system is causally isolated, energy will be conserved. Now, the believer in miracle doesn't deny that form of the principle. What the believer in miracle denies is that the system is causally isolated. So what the uh, believer in miracle is saying, yes, I can agree that energy be conserved in an isolated system, but I don't agree that the universe is in fact causally isolated from the possibility of divine intervention. So if we have events that seem to involve the addition of uh, mass or energy, they would be evidence that there is divine intervention. So you can't use you can't use the law understood as energy can neither be created nor destroyed as uh, a reason to reject that, 
because our only reason for accepting that energy can neither be created nor destroyed is that we've never observed it. Now, arguably, our best science leads back to it was, if, if we accept what I'm saying about the Big Bang Theory, but in any event, it can't be used to rule out a priori um, discussions of, uh, sorry, reports of what looked like a miracle. So if I granted your argument that the Big Bang was in fact evidence of some violation of the laws of physics. No, no, I'm not. Uh, you're not granting my, uh, that's not my claim. Well, so so by my definition, if uh, the laws of physics were created, that would be a violation. So by my definition, that would be a violation. But you don't have to accept that. But I'm just using my terminology here. So if oh. I granted that was the case, then I would be say, fine, that could definitely be evidence of miracles. And so you couldn't. You could no longer use the laws of physics to rule out miracles. So if you're correct that the beginning of the universe is evidence of somehow a change of physics. Or then... energy that, or evidence that energy was created. Or just, and just... Well, I, that would be a change in physics because I'm granting the first definition of the conservation of energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So if we have evidence that energy was created, like at the Big Bang, then that would be a violation of the first law of physics by my definition because it says no, it, can't. it would not because the first law says in an isolated system, and what the theist is denying is that you have an isolated system. Hmm. Look here. Here might be an analogy. If I uh, if I have a I have a box and I put in uh, twenty dollars in the box and then I leave the box in a room and I say, look, if this box uh, has no outside intervention, the twenty dollars will be there when I come back. Okay, I come back and the twenty dollars isn't there. I don't say I was wrong in asserting that if the box is an isolated system the $20 will still be there. Rather, I'm saying there was an outside cause intervened, okay? But my statement that if the box is an isolated system, the $20 will still be there is entirely correct in either, in either case. What I'm denying is that the universe is a causally isolated system. I'm quite well, happy I'm to taking say the system here of universe plus God. So if you have universe and God, Yes. Um, or just God. God is the system. And then God creates the no, universe. No, God is not the system. The, the theist is going to say that the universe is a distinct uh, entity different from God. Well, no, I, I grant that. So that's there's yes. multiple variables in a system. So system here is just all the different variables we're looking at. So if we look at all of the variables of reality, say at the beginning of the Big Bang, there's God and the universe. <laughs> Um, prior to that, there was just God, and then God created the universe, so he created energy, and if he didn't create it out of himself, like a battery, then he created it out of nothing. Well, right? he, he made something, so nothing. he didn't have to have something to make it, but he didn't take some nothing and make something out of it. Uh, well, he's creating energy from nothing, right? Is that, no, because yes. I don't think he's like taking a part of himself and just forming it in the universe. He's, you know, he's making yeah, energy from correct. nothing. So that would be a violation of the first law, wouldn't it? No. There was no, no energy prior to God making it. Right. So if that happened, that would be a violation of the first law. It'd be the first law is wrong. No. The first no. law in any kind of uh, scientific justification is that our observation is that in a causally isolated system, energy is conserved. It doesn't say anything about reality before there was energy. What it says is when you have energy, in a, if it's in a system that is causally isolated, that energy will be conserved. That says nothing about what, whether something external to the system could bring energy into the system or create energy. Well, so system here means anything, literally anything equals system. So God equals well, system. Well, God is not a physical object that's part of the system. Well, this doesn't say anything about physical objects. Energy in this context is simply defined as ability to change, to make change of any kind. And so God is a system, and God's ability to create the universe is energy of some kind. He has the ability to make change. 
And so him, no, that's going to make God energy, which no theist is going to uh, is going to accept. Right, but we have no evidence of anything but energy. There's no there's no evidence of a non-energy thing. So that well, seems like no. You're you're begging the question there. What? You're begging what? the question there. We would have to have a discussion on all sorts of issues. If mind body dualism is true, uh, Since then there no. would be something other. Uh, if theism is true, uh, like you can't expect me just to give you that the only thing we have any evidence of is energy. Well, in physics, the only evidence of if anything we have is energy. But physics no, like, only studies what is physical. It's because that's all it has to study. It has nothing. Like if there was right, another that, force. That doesn't, that doesn't suggest that there are not other realities to which you would have to have a different approach. And right, but so so if our best science, if if indeed our best science does point to an absolute beginning of the universe, that suggests that physics is in some sense incomplete. Right. So I would agree with that, but that seems like a if physics is incomplete, that's a violation of physics. So I would be happy to admit no, that. No, it's not. It's not a violation. It simply says it's incomplete. Like the fact that biology is incomplete doesn't mean that it's somehow a violation of something. Well, so like physics says energy will be conserved. And if energy isn't conserved at any point. No, it, then... physics says energy will be conserved in an isolated system. Sure. So That's energy will be conserved says. in an isolated system. Then you have, a, if you have an isolated system that doesn't do that, that would be a violation of physics. But it, that would be. But the denial of the person who believes in miracle is that you don't have an isolated system. Well, an isolated system here would mean all of reality. Everything that exists is an isolated system. It includes God, well, no, includes everything. That, you can't put God as a system. Like God is not just another piece of the universe. Like God exists in a different mode than matter. God exists necessarily. The theist will say other things exist contingently. So I, I believe every physicist would agree that's a violation of physics. Like that's like just in the definition. Like if you well, have something... I can give you all sorts of physicists that don't agree with that. Luke Barnes would be one. Um, like the physicist is not entitled a priori to claim that all of reality is physics. That's an a priori claim. All right. So that, that part, and if I you agree don't with. think something can come from nothing, then the big bang poses that there must be something other than the universe to cause it. Unless you're going to say you can have the whole shebang come in to existence on cost. Right. I believe that's why the consensus is that the universe came from a multiverse or many worlds or a string theory. But um, then I'm... you're into the problem that we I just we had the discussion with Valenkin. Um, he says no. Well, I believe all the evidence is on my side of that one. And I can I'm yes, I, I can believe... literally prove that. I can literally prove that I'm correct on this topic. And I could say that way. I can say the same thing. Well, I can I, say that, I, so it doesn't it doesn't help you there to to say I know this I can equally say I know this I'm cool. happy to I'm happy to uh, you know give you dueling experts and I think that uh, I can claim I know that the consensus will turn out to be on my side. You know, it's, it would be this I would love to have the opportunity to just call the Lincoln and ask him and then just be like oh, okay let's let's solve this one right now. Did That'd you say great. that? Yes. And of um, course, we'd have to uh, talk to uh, all sorts of other expert uh, cosmologists who say the Big Bang uh, clearly uh, uh, implies an absolute beginning. Yeah, no, I, I just saw the polls that. Yeah. Asked um, do you know the book that William Lane Craig and I'm not sure whether it was Quentin Smith, somebody else did, but it was uh, Theism and Big Bang Cosmology. Um, and in that. Right. Uh, it's older now. It was Oxford University Press. In that book, um, I think it's Quentin Smith, but I could be wrong on that. But he says, look, um, non-theist philosophers, atheist philosophers want to say, well, maybe you could have a universe uh, before uh, that somehow it was always existing. And he says, that's simply not an option. And as an atheist, he uh, feels it's necessary on the basis of analogy with quantum mechanics to say you can have a totally uncaused event. And that's his defense of how we escape the uh, Callum argument. But note that uh, 
as a professional philosopher of science, he uh, finds it necessary to go that route rather than to say we can have a past eternal universe. Uh, right, I agree. Like that's that's a very well established conclusion based on quantum mechanics that randomness is a fundamental force in physics uh, based on the no go theorem. So I agree that's a rational interpretation based on evidence. Uh, I don't think it's well. It's it's view. his option now. Then you're saying that you can get something out of nothing if you take that option. Right. That's why I was mentioning quantum mechanics earlier. Like if you're invoking quantum mechanics to get a fish, I'm like, yeah, that would not be a violation of physics. I agree on that one. Um, well, no, I'm not, but I'm invoking God as a cause. Right. And if you think you can get a fish that way, why are you ruling out getting God that way? Get Sorry, God getting the fish that way. Oh, I'm not. I'm, that's why I said at the beginning, if you're saying that God created a fish using the already existing laws of quantum mechanics, then that part I could potentially accept as a non-violation of the laws of physics. No, but it's uh, he doesn't need to fiddle with the laws at all. Well, that's that's the part I'm thinking that that would probably be by Hume's definition of violation. I'm pretty. Um, like, I wish we could ask him, but I think Hume would be like, "Yeah, that's a violation. That is literally well, what I mean by a violation." I think. Every I think if we could ask Hume, it might embarrass your position. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a fun experiment. Gonna resurrect <laughs> Hume? Can you? Can you? Can you? But like, it's create pretty a God well. It's Hume pretty well known in the literature, and here I do speak with expertise, rather than relying on uh, anybody else. Is that it's. Uh, Hume did not have a well-developed account of what a law of nature is. Uh, so Hume gives us no criteria by which to distinguish between uh, a, a regularity and a law. So for example, Hume says it's a law of nature that uh, dead men don't come back. Well, uh, you won't find that law uh, in any textbook. And suppose you had a case where uh, someone was clinically dead and we perform uh, CDR. We perform an operation and the person uh, comes back. We wouldn't say a law of nature had been violated. Right. We would talk about an intervening cause. Um, I, I would agree there, but I'm not seeing like, I would say that um, the general so regularities. Suppose, suppose instead of the human intervening and bringing back the dead person, God intervenes and bring back, brings back the dead person. Equally, no law of nature needs to be violated. Well, if, God if, I don't vi if I don't violate a law of nature in bringing about something that nature would not otherwise produce, then clearly God need not. Well, this is why I brought up the example of, of like, if I could create a new law of physics, would that be a violation? I'd say yes, unless... I was already using other laws of physics to do this, then me simply creating a new law of physics would be a but violation. Laws, laws of nature don't do anything in the sense of they're standing over uh, and making something happen. Rather, well, laws, are su laws supervene on causal powers. So what happens is masses attract one another, and they do so in a regular manner that we're able to develop an equation. Okay, but it's not like there's a law of gravity outside of things that is saying to the thing, okay, you move over and do this. Right, okay. I, I so agree. If God, if God creates more of something, then of course the laws apply. Uh, fish who were fish that were created, they will obey all the laws of nature going forward in in history. Uh, what what they don't have is the causes that usually lead to a fish existing. They have a different cause of their existing. So I understand a law. When anyone says a law, they mean a pattern in the nature of a quantum field. So it is a literal physical thing. Anytime anybody says law of physics, it is a physical thing, which is a pattern in a quantum field. So it's literally an existing thing. So if I was going to create a law of physics, that means I created a quantum field with a pattern. And that would be the creation of a law. So I don't, I obviously don't think laws are platonic objects or something or some kind of abstract ideals. I think every law is a physical pattern in a quantum field. And so if I created a new law, that would be creating a new quantum field or a new pattern in the quantum field that interacted in the world and did something. So suppose we create a further quantum field 
Are we going to have new laws of nature? No, we'll yes. have the, the laws that govern quantum fields. No, because what governs quantum fields are their nature. And so depending on how you define but its nature. If God be creates a, a quantum field that has yeah. the same nature as another quantum field, that quantum field is going to behave in the same way. Right. Okay. So if God creates a fish ex nihilo, that fish is going to behave in the same way as other fish. It will just have a different immediate origin than previous, than usual fish. Okay. God would simply be doing, God would simply be doing on a small scale, what he did on a large scale in the creation of the world. But again, both of those by any de definition of pretty much everybody I know is that's a violation. So I would say if you're going to create a law of physics, that is a violation of physics. But you haven't explained why it is. Because I think that a violation of physics is doing anything the known laws of physics cannot do. But so the laws of physics the that laws are in of physics by themselves don't do anything. Well, that's, like they I'm saying they do. They describe, I'm saying they they describe do. how matter behaves. No, no, no I'm saying the laws of physics are quantum fields. They literally do things. All of the laws. When anytime anyone says law, it is no, a literal, quantum, literally doing quantum, something. What, what quantum fields do things. Right. Quantum fields do things. Yes. So if God makes another quantum field, it will do the things that quantum fields do. But there, what, he won't have violated the laws of quantum fields. Nothing in how quantum fields behave tells us that we couldn't have another quantum field of right, a similar agree. nature. Nothing in how matter behaves says we could not have more matter. We that is what takes us back to this first principle that you know I've given you the the argument for. Uh, right. So, so I'm trying to I'm trying I to translate. A that, maybe a question that will help us here is why is violation then a big deal to you if that's how you're understanding violation? Why is violation a big deal to me? So it's yeah, not a violation big deal is, a, is a loaded term. Okay. To violate mm -hmm. something is to, is to harm it. So when you say, you know, you, you give me this, your understanding of what a violation is, it doesn't seem to me, uh, it seems to me be, be riding on some idea that a violation is a bad thing, but given violation how you is... understand violation, why, why would we be worried? Well, I'm, I don't consider violations a bad thing. I just consider them an unlikely thing. So if but we have we lots of unlikely things that happen. Mm. Sure. I'm not, it's unlikely that the earth will be hit by a, an asteroid. But that yes. doesn't make it a violation of a law. Right. So I would say that the probability of a violation of a law is so low that to think that that happened is a bad conclusion. So I would agree with Hume in this case that if we consider the possibility of a violation of the laws versus the possibility of someone had a delusion, the delusion is always going to be a better explanation here. Well, now always... we're back to now we're back to Hume. And that's yeah. this is what I will uh, no, I don't think so. Because one You're confusing two uh, two things concerning probability. An event which is improbable in terms of prediction need not be improbable uh, in terms of of somebody's noting that it indeed occurred. So, for example, winning the lottery, the probability of being able to predict that is pretty low, but yep. we don't require much evidence to be persuaded that somebody in fact did win the lottery. I agree. So, you know, you're winning the lottery is really, really improbable. But unfortunately, if somebody gives me testimony that you in fact did win the lottery. I don't require a huge amount of testimony to believe that that happened. Right. So I, I would agree, but I would say the analogy is more if there is some phenomenon, someone, you have testimony, someone said, I won the lottery. Is it more likely that that is a figment of someone's imagination that they lied? Or is it more likely true that I won the lottery? And I'd say it's more likely that it's a figment. Most people. So under no circumstances, if you tell me you won the lottery, I should believe you. 
Well, I'd say there are circumstances, but it would okay, be more so than just testimony. More than testimony? Yeah, like if you saw me driving a Ferrari, it'd be like, okay, now we got some evidence. But look, um, do you accept all the time, I would suppose, that if somebody, if the newspaper reports that somebody won the lottery, that that's a reliable report. If the if you consider the newspaper reliable, you don't uh, do what you just said that you would. I don't trust the newspaper at all. I'm not big on modern media. Well, but let's say I did. Let's say I did. So if I trusted the newspaper, and I trusted their reports, then I'd say it's reasonable to believe that person won the lottery. Yes. Um, in the same reason, uh, I would say if they saw I don't know a, a orangutan or something. I consider it reasonable. But if the newspaper posted somebody saw a unicorn, I'd say, nope, I would not believe it. There is 0% chance I would believe okay. a newspaper that said somebody saw a unicorn. But we the difference there is one of them has is only made up of discovered properties and one of them is made up of asserted properties that has no empirical basis. And so like people winning the lottery, like, yes, that happens all the time. We know that happens. So to say that someone did, while it's unlikely, there is still already an implicit basis of evidence for that. Whereas if we say someone saw a unicorn you know, zero implicit basis for that whatsoever okay. uh, let me make a couple of points here one the criteria for establishing whether an unusual event occurred would be different than the criteria of what its cause is <coughs> okay sure you would agree yep yeah. uh, so you have to be careful or a, a critic has to be careful in his or her argument uh, not to make the uh, difficulty of uh, being justified in recognizing unusual events to rule out naturalistic events that you would be inclined to accept on basis of testimony. Sure. You don't want your argument to prove too much. Right. But determining whether an event occurred, uh, that's a different question than whether we should call it a miracle. Wait, so, wait a minute. So that part I think I might disagree with. So like if we have um, an event that occurred, somebody saw a unicorn and they wrote it down, um, that could be caused by an actual unicorn existing or it could be caused by a delusion in their brain. But I still consider the event occurred either way. The event occurred, they had an experience of some no, kind. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not asking whether it's true that people thought they had this experience. I'm at, I'm, we're talking about whether they in fact had that experience. Uh, take as well, an example. Because like the whole point of Take as an example, own... meteorites. Yeah. There was a time... Um, Indeed, the uh, famous French astronomer Laplace, he refused to accept uh, accounts of stones falling out of the sky because his theory had no room for it. And the only people reporting this were peasants. Now, we could ask your question, which is more likely, that the person is deluded or that they actually had a stone fall out of the sky and that's what they're reporting? Okay, now it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take somebody with a PhD in physics to recognize being hit on the head with a stone, right? Sure. Uh, equally, when I meet people, I'm pretty good at telling whether at discerning whether they're alive or not. Sure. Okay, so supposing somebody reports to me, and there's no reason to think that they're uh, suffering from any kind of illness. There's no reason to think that their senses aren't in good shape. They report to me that uh, they ascertain that somebody died and then they meet the person three days later. Uh, can we can we recognize when somebody's alive? Generally. Yeah. Can we recognize when somebody's dead? We can be pretty reliable about that. Uh, so the question then, if we accept the event, is what's its best explanation? But it won't do to say, well, if the best explanation is miracle, therefore we can't accept the event. Because the question of whether we accept the event is a separate question from what's its cause. 
So stones falling out of the sky is a pretty unusual event. Unless we accept that event, we won't go in and ask what its cause is. Now, people who said the stone fell out of the sky and it's a miracle, they would be mistaken. But if they simply say the stone fell out of the sky, they could very well be right. The question right. is, what explanation do we give of the unusual event? So it won't do to say, well, if the unusual event would be most plausibly explained as a miracle, we can't accept it. Right. So I would agree to... with that part, but I would say that if there is a more plausible explanation that we already have evidence for, then we should accept that explanation over the miracle. Okay. And that's fair enough. So then we go to the question of what's the best explanation. Now we know that human agency can bring about events that nature would not otherwise produce or that would yeah. not otherwise happen. I think that's begging the question also. Well, like, agency, I don't think we know that. will you give me any kind of agency? Mm, I don't, I'm a determinist. I think that there's no free will. But you of any still, kind. I mean, if you, if you look at, uh, if you come across uh, Mount Rushmore to use a hackneyed example, yeah. you're going to talk about some agent doing that. You're going to say right. there was some kind of uh, agent, intelligent agency involved. Yeah. As long as we still, uh, assume that that's a result of physical forces acting on their brain or something. But now yeah. you're begging the question. Well, as, as a possibility, it's a possibility that it's as just a physical possibility. Forces. Okay. Yeah. Now suppose uh, we were to establish. Uh, you're familiar with the uh, story in the Gospel of John of the raising of Lazarus. Yep. Well, supposing we establish, uh, we have really good testimony that uh, Lazarus was in fact dead. And suppose we have really good testimony that he is, in fact, that he was later alive. Now, we have one set of issues around establishing that. But the separate question is, suppose we establish that, what's the best explanation? Delusion. Okay. And I would suggest that the best explanation there, if we've established that indeed it happened, is to appeal to some kind of intelligent agency. And that, why would that be better than delusion? Well, we just, you, you're going back to the first question. Well, I see those as, I think they're that separate delusion, questions. I don't see how they're separate questions. Well, I it's, see the like, step, it's the question of whether you are hit on the head with a rock falling out of the sky, separate from the question of whether that event has a natural explanation. Well, sure. But I'm saying like the, the question here is, is well, by analogy, this is the same issue. It's well, one not, thing I'm to not, say. I'm not seeing it. So help me, help me on. So I'm saying that okay. if we take your example of Laplace, where people say they saw rocks crawling out of the sky, I'd say Laplace is justified in saying, no, you probably had a delusion. If there's no background information that we have of, 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 of us have ever seen this occur, there's no testable predictions, there's no way to verify this, and we just have some testimony of a few people, then I'd say, nope, that's more likely a delusion. So even in the okay. case of Laplace, or in the case of Lazarus, if we have lots of evidence of people having delusions, we have very little evidence of rocks falling or people rising, the more rational conclusion is to say those people had a delusion than to grant the conclusion that what they said actually occurred. And that would be the better explanation of the phenomenon. Well, I disagree because uh, do you, I, I presume you've never been hit on the head with a meteorite. I assume so. Yeah. <laughs> and you've never seen a rock fall out of the sky. I've seen a meteorite, but let's assume no, I haven't. You've seen, you've seen a, a trail of light across the sky, but you have not seen, I presume, a rock fall out of the sky. Like literally all the way to the ground in front of my feet kind of a thing? No. Yeah. So why do you believe that that happens? Testimony. Um, testimony. More like Somebody, you've, you've read about meteorites. You've had people testify to you that this is indeed what they've experienced. And you presume them to be honest. You presume them not to be deluded. Uh, because I could run your same argument. I could say, well, you know, those scientists, they were just credulous. Sure. But but I'd say I don't care about the testimony at all. I don't care about anything anybody says. All I care about is, does it but make no Then you're going to limit. And this was a, this was a, a problem that uh, plagued Hume. And uh, he never satisfactorily got around it that 
then you're limiting what you can believe to your own private experience. Well, no, because I'm saying that novel testable predictions, if you can successfully predict things we don't know yet and get it right, if anybody could do that. But you're, you're believing that, that that's done based on testimony. You believe in, in media rights based on the testimony of others. Well, no, no. It's the testimony here is irrelevant. It's superfluous. They no, make a testable how, prediction. How did you come to believe in, in meteorites? Right, right. So I can listen to someone's testimony that they made a testable prediction. Um, but, but then you're made, believing it, them that they made a testable prediction. That part's irrelevant. The part that counts as evidence is did they actually successfully make a testable prediction, yes or no. Now, whether I accept that on insufficient evidence doesn't matter. I don't care. What matters, what is the evidence? The only thing that counts as the evidence is did they successfully make a novel testable prediction? And I can do this myself and say, if a meteorite happens, there's going to be a loud sound and a big, if it hits the ground, it's going to cause a loud crater or whatever. And I can test that and go to the locations that have this and see if it occurs. So I can make novel testable predictions. But what I count as evidence is not ever the testimony. I don't care about what anything says. But then you're going, to be, in trouble. Is, then you're going to be in trouble on historical science. Like you're back to the demarcation problem um, right. because there are things that you would presumably accept as scientific and you would probably accept as and that you would accept as being probably true but they're not empirically testable like what so for my historical claims uh, well, i accept that for are those... example for example we have um we have hypotheses about what caused the great die off of the dinosaurs yep. now you can't come back and you know do a real life uh, huge meteor striking the earth, killing off all the dinosaurs, and yet you uh, accept that as being scientific. You may even accept it as being probably true. Um, and you would be able to give reasons, but those reasons would be based on somebody saying, look, we've done this. Done this. I, well, I'd say that we have evidence of meteorites existing in reality. We have evidence mm -hmm. of volcanoes existing in reality. So either of those are potential explanations of the dinosaurs die off. Magical unicorns, magical leprechauns don't have any evidence of those. So those are not plausible explanations. But have I have I said anything about magical unicorns or leprechauns? No. I've well, talked I'm, about... I'm addressing your demarcation problems. So the demarcation here that I'm saying is what makes a plausible explanation versus an implausible explanation is discovered properties versus asserted properties. So discovered properties are things that have been able to successfully make novel testable predictions, whether or not I know it. Um, and asserted properties are things that have not been able to successfully make novel testable predictions, whether or not I know it. Um, and so in this context, volcanoes and meteorites have successfully made novel testable predictions and all kinds of things in science, whether or not I know it is irrelevant. And so those are good plausible explanations but, of why the dinosaurs died. Whereas, But if you don't know it, on what basis are you saying that it's been done? You're well, again, testimony. Again, so I don't, whether I know it is irrelevant here. I don't care if I know it. I can just be a brain in a vat. It makes no difference to me whether or not I know but it. But how do you know it is the question. How do you know it? You know it because people have told you we've made these predictions. I don't, I don't care. Pretend I don't. Pretend I don't know it. Pretend I know literally nothing. I was born five seconds ago. I know nothing. Mm -hmm. I can still say it's a valid explanation if it's been able to make novel testable predictions. It's not a valid explanation if it hasn't made novel testable predictions. So I don't care if I know it. All I need to know is say is here is a demarcation of a good standard of evidence versus a bad standard of evidence. And the good standard of evidence is the ability to successfully predict the future. And a bad standard of evidence is just doesn't, is not able to do that. And whether you do that via testimony or not, I don't care. It doesn't matter the means that you do this. I don't care. But so you're going to insist that prediction equals explanation. Be evidence. Prediction would be evidence. Okay. But suppose uh, you couldn't, suppose there's an instance where you can't predict what I will do, but nevertheless, there's a report that I did something. Are you going to say, well, that's not an explanation, the fact that I couldn't predict, but I later give a reason to you why I did it? Uh, I'm not following, like, um, my, my, my ability do to... You know, do you know Richard Swinburne's distinction between personal explanation and law explanation? Not very, not very well, no. Okay. Um, we will often give an explanation of something we did that does not, uh, that it was not 
predictable, but nevertheless, it's accepted as an explanation of what we did. Like the John Lennox bake the cake. Why did you bake the cake analogy? Um, I'm not sure I know Lennox, but that, yeah, I think it's in that, uh, in that line of argument. Gotcha. So yeah, I would agree there, but I'd say that like, I wouldn't say that I need to be able to predict your psychological motivations if those things have already been predicted in other instances. So if I say uh, people like other people, so they bake cake or whatever, that's a past. We have lots of examples of that. So I could predict that if my mom loves me, she will bake a cake. I wake up on my birthday. Oh, there's a cake. That's a confirmatory testable prediction that my mom loves me or something. Um, and so I say you can make those kinds of testable predictions. Once you do, motivations like that are now an acceptable. But what, if it's, what if it's this way? What if it's uh, you, you're you sure your mom loves you, but you know there's lots of things you like besides cake. Knowing that your mom loves you doesn't automatically enable you to predict that she's going to make you a cake. Sure, I, I wouldn't. That wouldn't make a difference okay. to me. I'm so saying that if an atheist says, look, uh, God is of a certain nature, we would predict that on occasion he does certain things. Intervene in nature. Um, that would be a prediction. Sure. And we would say, look, the fact that we have events for which there's no plausible naturalistic explanation and fit with what we take to be God's character, wouldn't that be, uh, wouldn't that be as good as what we do in other areas? Sure, I would. I would agree there, but the well, I would disagree. I would claim that that is in fact the case. Well, I, I would disagree with that. No plausible natural explanation part. That part, I think we have for every one of them. We have a plausible natural explanation. It was a delusion. But, but there, you have to then give me reasons why that is not ad hoc, because there, we have. We have pretty good science as to when people are uh, under delusion. Uh, we we have criteria for distinguishing between when somebody's under delusion or not. So, you know, what it will not do is to say, well, anytime it uh, somebody reports something that I can't get my mind around happening or can't provide a plausible natural explanation for, therefore it didn't exist and they say it must have been a delusion, you're a priori ruling out uh, non-natural explanations. Well, that, I don't think that's a priori. That would be a posteriori. So if I have prior evidence of delusions in this case and no evidence of it occurring... But then, what if you but, don't have prior evidence of delusion? What if so the that, people... That would be, so that, that would be an interesting... What you just said to me earlier was that you would insist the person was deluded even if you don't have any independent evidence for them being deluded. Um, well, that's that part I'm getting lost on because I think we have tons of evidence of human well, brains what, being deluded. What evidence did Laplace have for people being in it? You, you said you would agree with Laplace. Yes. What evidence did he have that these peasants were in fact deluded? I would imagine, I don't know much about Laplace, but I would imagine he has lots of examples of people being deluded. And I think he'd have a higher proportion of delusion among peasants. And so he would probably be rational to conclude that peasants were delusional at a higher rate and said lots of things of this kind that but were peasants, false. Peasants are as uh, capable of noting a rock falling out of the sky as a university professor. Sure, but they're also more capable of noting false things than a university professor. A university that might, professor well, false explanations, but I don't think they're automatically more uh, at risk of being mistaken about a rock falling out of the sky than a university professor would be. I think they would be, yes. So like to give an example, there's because a specific- Because they're credulous? Credulous? I don't, mm, I think just ignorant. I think ignorant would be a better term here. So for example, to What take, does it take to recognize a stone falling out of the sky? Not well, very much. To recognize it wasn't a delusion would take more. Like if, to recognize the difference between was this a thing that actually happened versus a part of your imagination. There are many different things that we think are real, false memories <coughs> that are false. And as a university professor, you'd be more inclined to understand that that is a possibility and how to filter out that possibility than a peasant. For example, there are bereavement delusions. Bereavement delusions we know are extremely common. They happen to about 60 percent of old people who have a dead loved one they see hear, can touch their dead loved one after they die a university professor who knows what a bereavement delusion is isn't going to say 
I literally saw my raised dead loved one. They're going to say I probably had a bereavement delusion. A peasant so who doesn't all know of this information but uh, then... would, would not have that information. They wouldn't know what a bereavement delusion is. And so they're more plausible to say, I literally touched my dead loved one. They came back from the dead. Um, and so I would be rational to be more credulous of the, the claim of the peasant because they don't have the information of the different kinds of mental delusions that humans have to be able to filter those out as a possibility. Therefore, in the same case of the scene, the rocks fall from the sky. Because the peasants don't have the background knowledge to differentiate biases and delusions that are innate in human brains, they would be less qualified to assess whether the, the event that they saw was a real event versus something they had a delusion and just didn't, didn't know what the delusion was. Well, um, going back to whether the event occurred and um, what's the best explanation, we have events of uh, what you might call spontaneous healing, uh, where we we know the event occurred, and we can believe it on the basis of testimony. Um, okay, so uh, yep. then that brings us back to the question of what is the best explanation, and it won't do there to say, well, everybody that has seen this person and says, you know, they're healed of a condition. They were instantaneously healed of a condition. Uh, it won't do to dismiss all their testimony as the basis that they're deluded. So then the question will go to the second issue of what's the best explanation. Okay. Yep. I agree. Okay. So at least in principle, uh, testimony can establish highly, highly unusual events. Sure. Okay. So then the question is, what's the best explanation of those events? Well, actually, wait, I would probably say that testimony would give us a reason to investigate. And if we could investigate and find empirical data, then we would believe the event occurred rather than simply, I don't think the testimony is enough there. So like if but do you, there's a miraculous healing, for example, you, like cancer. Well, wait, wait, I haven't called it a miraculous healing yet. I've only well, I think those happen. I think I think the healings like uh, spontaneous remission, I think those happen. So I think those are real events, um, spontaneous healings. I think those are those are real events. Okay. Um, and, but you probably believe that on the basis of testimony, like because, look, I want these two questions separated. One, are we entitled to believe the event happened? OK, at this point, I'm only asking uh, did the event happen? And I think on the basis of testimony, we can very often take ourselves to be justified in believing the event happened, even though it may not be predictable. Well, that's the, so I think I disagree question, with you. You don't agree with that? Or you do? No, I wouldn't. So like in the case of spontaneous healings, are we rational to believe they happen based on testimony? I'd say, nope. I'd say in order to believe they're rationally happened, we would need <laughs> x-rays we would need uh actual things we could see we would need the blood samples that shows they have the antibodies or whatever are uh, well you just you just told me that you believed this that these spontaneous healings happen because they have all of those things but they have all but what basis are you believing it on and taking yourself to be justified in believing it well, again, my personal knowledge here is irrelevant. The fact that but I believe, sure, but I'm, but I'm asking you: Do you believe? Do you accept that your belief is justified? Mm, sort of. So I'd well, say that if I really cared, if I really wanted my belief justified, I would investigate in the field, find the actual data myself, and then confirm it. Yeah, um, I um, don't do that because I don't care. So I wouldn't say mine is sufficiently justified to. Um, the degree that I think you're asking the question about, but I think that um, it could be. I think I could go do the research. I could justify it in this case very easily. Um, I'm just sufficiently inductively accepting of the methodology of science to just trust the methodology of science, um, regardless me, of uh, my... Let me refer you then to a book here called Testimony by C.J.A. Cody. Um, and he argues uh, very carefully, very expertly, it's the standard uh, in the uh, discussion of testimony, is we can't get out. What is his name? C.J.A. Cody? 
I believe that Cody C O A D Y, and the book is Testimony. Um, I believe it's uh, the epistemological status of testimony, two thousand and two. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, um, you will find that you can't get as free from testimony as you're suggesting you can. Um, but assume. <laughs> Assuming that we can establish the event occurred, we could take blood tests of the person. We can take x-rays before and after we've established the event occurred. Okay. Yep. Then we move to the question of what's its best explanation. Yep. Okay. And if, if as we investigate, it gets harder and harder, the more we know, then that would seem to be reason to say that it's more probable that we have a non-naturalistic explanation than a naturalistic explanation. Now, why do I say that? Well, we know that intelligence can produce uh, structures and patterns in nature that would not otherwise occur. So we look at this and we say, look, uh, as far as we know, with undirected forces, uh, this can't happen. And then we say we look at it for another 20 years, and the more we know, the harder it is to provide the naturalistic explanation. Then at some point, uh, the best explanation would seem to be uh, an explanation in terms of intelligent causality. Now, if we know we didn't do that, then it becomes uh, rational to think that we can make reference to a non-natural uh, intelligent cause. I probably wouldn't agree with that because I'd think until we had some independent evidence of a uh, intelligence outside of brains or an intelligence made of brains that are outside of humans <laughs> or something, then it couldn't be a plausible explanation that such a thing did anything. So if we had, here's a miraculous healing, we can't explain it. Um, and no matter what we look at in nature, we don't find a way to explain it. I don't think we could then infer it was a non-natural intelligent design because we don't have any evidence of non-natural things, just like we don't have any evidence of a natural well, what, force that could do What this. would you allow to be evidence for non a non-natural intelligence? intelligence? So I'd say what that I could give a prediction say if there is a non-natural intelligence say it's named bob bob will do something in the universe if i pray to bob he'll generate a gold brick I pray to bob uh -huh. gold brick appears that would 100 percent be evidence of bob okay or, now does bob have to do it every time you ask bob a uh, higher rate than chance whatever that means so okay. gold bricks appearing have a pretty low rate of chance so it just has to happen so supposing we find that we have these kinds of healings at a higher rate than chance could they be taken as evidence for this uh, non-natural intelligence? If there's a causal relation that it happens under some testable position. So if you pray to Jesus and it happens at a higher rate than if you pray to the spaghetti monster, then yes. Okay. So in principle, you uh, would agree. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Novel testable predictions I'm happy with. So if you could pray okay. to a particular God and it happened at a higher rate than at any other um, control standard. Yeah, absolutely. That's evidence. Yeah, and what I would argue, um, what I argue is that this is in fact empirically the case. Um, so when I talk about miracle, uh, and you'll see this in my uh, in my book, the legitimacy of miracle, I say the the philosopher's task is to remove the conceptual underbrush, like where you and I have arrived is you've said, well, in principle, you could convince me that it's a miracle if the empirical data were right. Okay. Yeah. And I started with this, that, actually. I was trying to give that exactly is, that. This is a long way from Hume, who said that never in principle could you be justified in believing in a miracle. Um, so, yes, if you want to know whether miracles occur, then all that philosophy can do is remove bad objections. The task of saying whether in fact this happens will be a historical inquiry. Okay. Oh yeah, I absolutely agree. I would agree that yeah. saying that it's in principle impossible for miracles to happen would be false. I would agree. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think Hume, we've made some progress since Hume there and I believe that it is 
possible for miracles to occur, but I do believe it is as long as there is a more plausible alternative explanation, then it won't be justified to conclude miracles and you would need some kind of novel test and predictions to get there. Yeah. Well, I would agree what I would argue. And again, I, for the, uh, for a better than us, uh, interrupting each other and talking over each other, uh, I'd, uh, suggest, uh, my, my book, the legitimacy of miracle, um, the, uh, the question is, as I would say, uh, it is ultimately an empirical question. And uh, maybe we both agree that uh, when you come to the arguments for God's existence, <coughs> I think it's very important and very helpful to take them in line with, the, uh, with our science. So if we're looking at the teleological argument, I think it's relevant to look at uh, scientific questions around the origin of life. If we're looking at the Callum cosmological argument, I think it's uh, very helpful to look around to look at the uh, cosmologists. So, you know, if you're right that we could uh, that we don't need an eternal universe, sorry, that we don't need a a a past beginning universe, then that uh, that undermines the Callum cosmological argument to a great degree. Um, but it is important to give a fair uh, inquiry into uh, into the competing explanations. Is it like if we begin by saying, "Well, it, it's always the case that a natural a naturalist explanation has to be better than a non-natural explanation," that introduces an a priori element that is not uh, it's not fair debate. Then, oh yeah, absolutely, I would agree entirely. I'd say that you need an a posteriori basis of evidence to conclude that, but you'd never be able to do it a priori for any reason. Yeah. So you might say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you might say we agree largely on approach. We disagree where the results come out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, <coughs> Ricky DePere asks, Ask him what year and who is quote is from versus your last year direct quote. I think he's asking about the Valinkin thing. When was the quote in the book from the Valinkin one, and when was the quote from my video? Which one is more new? I think. Um, well, if you're right, I think your quote is more new, but I'm not sure that you did. You actually show Valinkin, or did you show colleagues of his? I I showed Valinkin himself and Guth himself. Okay, but did you show Valinkin saying? Yes, there's a picture of him on the screen. Like if you go back to the video um, at the timestamp, you'll actually see Valinkin himself speaking in his voice and Guth himself speaking in his voice. Yeah, um, I'm happy to uh, send you the link to the quotation that I gave. Uh, cool. Can your uh, can the questioner get that from you? Sure, but he was asking what year it was. Do you just have the year that I was um, like a 2002 book or something? Just a minute till I see whether I do, whether I can get back to it quickly. Um, 2006, I believe. Mine are from 2022. Yeah. Um, I would caution your listener, though, that that does not. Uh, um, I have a link here I'll send to you on his uh, article uh, where he did October 2015 inference. Uh, it's uh, an art. It's an article. Um, and uh, I would hope that you would agree that we would have to take him in the context of what he most says. Okay. Um, is there another question? Yep. Um, bl blow me up asks how many gods are possible. If one is possible, what would make that God special if there's more than one? Um, what I would argue here is that uh, if you want to get a coherent, a coherent metaphysics, uh, polytheism isn't going to work very well. Um, and indeed, pretty well all polytheistic religions posit something more fundamental than the gods. 
Gotcha. Uh, Goblin Lord asks, why do you think he can have an explanation if we only have an account of an observation? We may not have enough info. Um, well, we may have lots more than one observation, uh, but routinely we, um, we develop hypotheses to explain our observations. And technically, science is always in the danger of affirming the consequent. We take, uh, we take hypotheses to explain observations, but if there's more than one hypothesis that explains the observation, how do we decide between hypotheses? And you and I have precisely been going at that this morning. Um, you may grant that a certain event happened, say a spontaneous healing. Uh, you're going to want to say, well, my hypothesis better explains it than your hypothesis. So what science typically does is it employs what's known as abduction, inference to the best explanation. So typically for large scale hypotheses such as naturalism or theism, we will need to develop a cumulative case argument from all sorts of different areas. Gotcha, Goblin Lord also asks, it sounds like you are stating because we accept something did happen we must also attribute it to the something even without sufficient info the asserted cause i imagine he means no i'm precisely denying that uh, that's why i want to separate the two questions of did the event happen from the question of what's its best explanation and when we are deciding whether an event happened i'm wanting to say that theory should not trump um observation so all too often scientists get uh they fall in love with a certain theory and when something happens that doesn't uh, fit the theory they deny it so the example i gave of laplace laplace denied that precisely because astronomy at the time had no uh, room for ast uh, for meteors so uh very strongly i want to say that observation trumps theory the fact that I would not expect something as a theist, say evil, should not prevent me from acknowledging evil. Um, the non-theist seeing an event that it's very difficult to give a natural explanation for should not therefore deny that the event happened based on the fact that it's difficult to explain naturalistically. Gotcha. Um, Paul D asks, why won't Pia's polytheism work what is what do you mean you said that to have a coherence worldview you polytheism would not work well um various reasons uh, one you're going you don't uh, have a, a unity and typically you begin to ask for origin of the different gods so for example in greek polytheism you find uh, that aphrodite her origin story is the foam that collected around uh, Zeus's, uh, no, sorry, I think it's Uranus's genitals when they were thrown into the sea by Zeus. Um, they just don't see, polytheism doesn't uh, fare well when it's exposed to rigorous uh, philosophical thinking. I think he's more generally asking, why wouldn't it be possible to have multiple necessary beings essentially at the same time? Why would you need one? Um, You've then got a problem of how those uh, beings relate, and you typically seem to uh, push it back to some common environment that they both inhabit. And then the question is, well, this environment seems to be more fundamental than the uh, things that are inhabiting it. Couldn't the environment just be one of the necessary things? So there's a necessary connection between two necessary beings. And then you're going to have beings. puzzles over what is the relationship between these different necessary beings. Now, I'm not saying that it's logically impossible. I'm saying that <coughs> as you develop, uh, excuse me, as you develop uh, a, a comprehensive understanding of reality, it doesn't uh, wind up being the best explanation. Gotcha. Uh, Big Bad Mama asks, most biblical scholars know that the miracles to be metaphors. Why do you insist they are literal events? Um, I disagree that most biblical scholars um, uh, view it thus. Um, 
I would say, t in addition to that, um, I don't think truth should be uh, determined by consensus. Uh, I think it should be determined by argument. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to give you a list of biblical scholars who take, uh, take the events recorded in, say, the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, as they, they, don't, uh, they don't give the indications of metaphor. So there are ways and genres by which we recognize metaphor. Uh, the Gospels don't display that. Gotcha. Benjamin Thomas Blodgett asks, what is a falsifiable test you can perform to check your beliefs? Um, I think that will differ for different people depending on what their background beliefs are. Um, it's notoriously difficult to falsify large-scale theories. Let me give you an example. Some people have said that uh, uh, evolution as a theory would be falsified if you found a the fossil of a rabbit in uh, Precambrian uh, uh, strata. The well, I, can guarantee, I can guarantee you that that would not work because that would be ruled out as an outlier, as probably a fraud, a delusion, et cetera, et cetera. You would need a large accumulation of evidence. And it's very difficult in advance to say what that would be. At some point, if enough discordant evidence comes in, then you move on to a different, uh, a different uh, explanation. That may be happening in the uh, area of the origin of life. Uh, the more we know, the harder it is to give a naturalistic explanation. Okay. Uh, CJ asks, how does the hypothesis of an unembodied mind predict anything about the world? If Robert needs to build a specific desires into his hypothesis, how is he not merely engaging in a just so story? Um, <coughs> I think a, a, a good atheist philosopher that you might want to look at here is Paul Draper. And uh, he would make the point that uh, it's as long as your hypothesis is not entirely ad hoc, then it's legitimate. Uh, if we have some ideas about uh, what we would take the nature of a divine being to be, then it's legitimate to use that as a hypothesis. So, for example, it seems clear that evil is evidence against the God hypothesis. The question is, is it sufficient evidence to say that God does not exist. Um, we must always uh, evaluate um, disconfirming negative evidence in the context of positive evidence. If there was no positive evidence for God's existence, then it's entirely uh, uh, justified for uh, the person uh, looking at the problem of evil to say God does not exist. Uh, I suspect Tom would take that position. Yep, that there is and no I would, positive I would evidence, agree. and that evil is disconfirming. Um, on the other hand, I would argue that we have all sorts of positive evidence, and uh, that it outweighs the negative evidence from evil. And I would agree with uh, Draper that any any you can make up any hypothesis you want as long as it's not logically contradictory. I'm fine with that. Um, Benjamin Thomas Badgett asks, what would be evidence against your belief? Um, well, one is I, uh, I admit that evil, evil is evidence against my belief. Um, I suppose if we were to come up with, uh, with evidence that the universe has existed eternally, that I would see that as counting against the Callum cosmological argument, which I think is compelling. Um, again, if we had uh, a totally convincing uh, naturalistic account of the origin of life and things like the Cambrian explosion, I would say that that uh, would put paid to the teleological argument, maybe not the fine-tuning form of the teleological argument, but that um, that would undermine my confidence. Um, it's relevant here to mention Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas says there are two basic, um, two basic reasons that people uh, do not believe in God. 
One is they don't think the hypothesis of God is necessary to explain things. So Occam's razor, uh, do not multiply entities needlessly would come into effect. The second is the problem of evil. Now, I happen to think um, <coughs> that uh, appealing to, uh, to God as a necessary explanation of the origin of universe, as the uh, origin of biological life and development of biological life, I happen to think that we're not multiplying entities needlessly, but that the data requires it. Gotcha. Uh, I think that is it for the questions. And we had been going for about two hours. Really appreciate you coming on. It was a great conversation. Do you want to give any links or references where people can find out more about your work? Uh, uh, it won't be for a month or so, but uh, I am at the moment uh, having a website developed and there will be a uh, a number of my articles there and perhaps some selections from my book. Um, uh, so um, maybe if Tom gets back in touch with me a few months from now, um, I can send him a link. Or Cool. What, and uh, what is your book about? What is my book about? Yes. Or, um, there is a book. Go ahead. There's a book. Uh, the book I would refer people to, I've written a number on Miracle, but the book is called The Legitimacy of Miracle. Um, uh, I noticed John has a question. What does Larmer make of Fail's argument against divine intervention? Um, I do have a response to Fail's book. And uh, if people want to email me um, at rlarmer at unb.ca, um, I'm happy to uh, provide links or in some cases the, the article. Um, if you just think I'm an idiot, uh, I'd appreciate if you don't uh, contact me, if you just want to call me an idiot. But if you're looking for uh, for some of my material um, or perhaps a reference to material I'd recommend, then by all means, uh, feel free to uh, to email me. Do you have a short version of what is Larmer's argument and your response to it? For Miracle? Or, yeah. What are for fails? Fails argument against oh fails argument. Uh, fails um, does not. Uh, he 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 begs the question by saying, "Well, we always know that energy is conserved, but that fails to acknowledge that if miracles occur, then energy is not conserved in the universe." Uh, so he can't he can't rule out energy. Um, never being created by simply saying it never happens uh, and then use that as a reason to say, therefore, miracles can't happen because that would be like saying, well, we know there are no mice here because there's no evidence. But then if I give you evidence of the mice, you say, well, there couldn't be mice here because we've already established there are no mice. But for the longer version, uh, look up the article. It's... Uh, in the uh, International Journey for Philosophy of Religion. If you drop me an email, I can send you the uh, reference. And Kane wanted me to ask his question. Do you believe in witches? Uh, how much do you attribute your life to witches? I think because there's been lots of testimony of witches in the past kind of thing. How much do you attribute to your daily life to witchcraft spells? Um, I would say, uh, really, I don't attribute uh, what happens in my life. I don't think I attribute any of it to witchcraft spe spells. Um, perhaps, um, I think the argument is implying there's tons and tons of testimony of witchcraft and witches, but we reject that. <laughs> why wouldn't we um, do the same to miracles kind of a thing? I would be happy to explain why I reject that and not miracles. Um, that goes into the detailed empirical stuff. I will say that, uh, we in history, uh, can be ashamed of uh, what happened to a lot of women uh, when uh, witchcraft was taken so, so seriously. Now, you might ask a further question. I, I don't think that I would link it to witches, but uh, you might ask, do I believe in a devil or do I believe in demons? That's, uh, that's a different question. Gotcha. And do you have like a, just a brief answer to why you would reject witch testimony but not miracle testimony? What is the difference between those kinds? Because I think most atheists see them as pretty much synonymous. The amount of evidence. I can point to really, really strong evidence for miracles. 
and it's uh, not nearly as good evidence for witchcraft. Now, I, that does not mean that I don't think that you could have evil supernatural influences that cause things in the world. Gotcha. All right. That's it for the questions. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, you too, Tom. Thanks.